as we continue on in our series. Judges chapter 14, starting with verse 1, the word of God says, Samson went down to Timna and saw that there was a young PYT. Those of you who didn't get it, it's not for you. (laughs) Saw a Philistine, a Philistine young thing. And when he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timna. Uh, Now get her as my wife. His father and mother replied, isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, get her for me. Boy, I wish Nathan would come at me like that. (laughs) His parents, however, did not know that this was from the Lord, who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines, for at that time they were ruling over Israel. Let us pray. Father, we open our hearts to you. We ask you to have your way with us. May your spirit, may your spirit fall afresh. Open our eyes and our ears that we may hear, that we may see. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. So last week we talked about the unnamed woman, the unnamed wife of Manoah, although one of our members, uh, Steve, he he said, uh, Steve Trapero, he said that, Samson's mother did have a name. And I said, really? He said, yeah, her name was Sam. It was short for Samantha, Sam's son. Cheesy. (laughs) But the unnamed woman, the unnamed woman in chapter 13, who the angel of the Lord spoke to, and even when Manoah said, Lord, please send your messenger so that I may know, that I can have it confirmed, Even then, the angel comes comes back to the woman, and she has to go fetch her husband. And we learned in that message the reason why the messenger of the Lord spoke to the wife and not the husband. And some of our ideologies were a little bit challenged as we realized the most important prerequisite for God using people is spiritual sight, to be able to see, to be able to know God. God wants to use people that understand his character, that know his workings. And and this is such an important part for spiritual strength is to have spiritual sight. So here we come to chapter 14 and and Samson, who the Lord, who the Bible told us the Spirit of God was stirring with him at the end of chapter 13. Now we see the byproduct of the stirring of the Holy Spirit. The stirring of the Holy Spirit is that he has the hots for a Philistine woman from Timnah. And the parents are coming with some spiritual insight saying, come on, son, really? Among the uncircumcised? What does the scriptures tell us? That we should not be unequally? Oh, man, we know this word. Many of you got married against the protest of your parents because you were not equally yoked. She's Catholic. You're Seventh-day Adventist. She's agnostic. You're a Christian. He... He, he's Muslim, and you, you, you went to Sabbath school. Like, how in the world can you join together? And many parents have used those, the scriptures to, to, to clearly point out that God wants us to be yoked equally, not unequally. But there was a reason God didn't want his people to be unequally yoked. Do you know what that reason was? Was, was God a racist? Was God prejudiced? We know that's not the case because even when he he selects Abraham, he says, I'm going to bless you and make you a great nation. I'm going to make you a great nation so that you can bless all nations. Amen? Israel was to be lifted up and favored so that they could be an instrument and they could be they could be God's representatives on planet Earth. They were they were there to bless all nations. God has never wanted to discriminate, but there was a reason why he did not want them to be unequally yoked. What's that reason? What what would happen when Israelites were intermarrying with other different groups, different religious affiliations? What was happening? Eventually, 
Israel would start following after the other gods. This happens most famously in the life of Solomon, who got so twisted in his relationships with women from other areas that, that he was sacrificing children to the fire, to the god Molech. And so God didn't want any of that to be among his people, so he was really intentional about them not being unequally yoked. So what do we do with this text? The text tells us that God's spirit was leading them. What do you do with this text? The spirit of God was leading Samson to pick a fight with the Philistines. And the parents, although they're giving good counsel, good wisdom, they don't realize that God is behind all of this. Now, we learn in chapter 13 that Samson is to be set apart as a Nazarite, dedicated wholly to the Lord. And because of that, there were certain things that he had to follow. For sure, as a Nazarite, you could not be intermarrying in different faiths. It wasn't going to happen. But watch what happens in this journey among the Philistines. Watch what happens here. It says that in chapter 14, verses 5 and 6, it says, Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother, as they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him powerfully, the Bible says, powerfully upon him, so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. And I'm just going to pause there. They make it sound like tearing a young goat is easy. I mean, I would have liked, liked tearing it as easy as you tear paper. No, a young goat. I mean, these guys were, they, they were ripped buff. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. I'm assuming that they went down together, but Samson was far ahead of his parents. And so he hears this lion. It, it comes out of the, the bushes, and it, it attacks him, and the Spirit of God comes upon him, and he tears apart this lion. What's the problem with this text? What's the problem with this text? Anybody notice what's wrong with this text? Anybody? As a Nazarite, what's wrong with this text? Let's go to Numbers, Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6 gives us instructions on how a Nazarite is to be set apart. And we are going to learn from the jump that this man, Samson, isn't following the instructions. Look at Numbers, Numbers chapter 6, starting with verse 2. Numbers chapter 6, starting with verse 2. It says, speak to the Israelites and say to them, if a man or woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of dedication to the Lord as a Nazarite, they must abstain from wine and other fermented drink and must not drink vinegar made from wine or other fermented drink. They must not drink grape juice. What? This is like some serious, I thought, I thought at first, I was like, oh, this is Adventism. No, 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 this is deeper. They're not even allowed to have Welch's, grape juice. They must not drink grape juice or eat grapes or raisins. As long as they remain under their Nazarite vow, they must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, not even the seeds or the skins. Question, if you're not supposed to eat anything from the vine, why are you walking through a vineyard? Right? That's the first red flag. That's the first red flag. Let's continue on here. The Bible says in verse 5, we're still in number 6, verse 5, it says, During the entire period of their Nazarite vow, no, no razor may be used on their head. This is what we're most familiar with. They must be holy until the period of their dedication to the Lord is over. They must let their hair grow long. Throughout the period of their dedication to the Lord, the Nazarite must not go near a... must not go near a dead body, even if their own father or mother or brother or sister dies... They must not make themselves ceremonial unclean on account of them because the symbol of their dedication to God is on their head. All right, we're going to put a pin there, right? It, it, is, it, is, it is a symbol. His long hair is a symbol of his dedication to God, okay? So they're not allowed to be around dead things, dead people. Verse 9, if someone dies suddenly in the Nazarite's presence, thus defiling the hair that symbolizes their dedication, they must shave their head on the seventh day, the day of their cleansing. Then on the eighth day, they must bring two doves or two young pigeons to the priest at the entrance to the tent meeting. 
The priest is to offer one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering to make atonement for the Nazarite because they what? They sinned by being in the presence of the dead body. That same day, they are to consecrate their head again. Question, why does Samson not want his parents to know that he killed the lion? Because as a Nazarite, he's not supposed to be around anything that is... All right, so let's just start off right here, okay? Let's just, let's just deal with the elephant or the white lion in the room, okay? Watch this, watch this. He's in a place he's not supposed to be, a vineyard. Can we start there? While he's in a place where he's not supposed to be, he ends up attacking a lion. Now, you might say the lion was attacking him. Fine, right? Tomato, tomato. He tears the lion into two pieces. The lion now is a dead carcass. Who is now defiled? Na Samson's now defiled, and it's now considered a sin. And he doesn't want to go through any of the purification rites to get back his commitment and consecration to God. He doesn't want to shave off his head. He doesn't want to do any of that. So he just wants to keep it quiet. He doesn't care that he's in a vineyard. He doesn't care that he's around a dead animal. He doesn't care about any of this stuff. He has already broken his vows to God. And yet the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. Very strongly, very powerfully, the Bible says. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. Let me start with this. I don't think that he would have faced a lion if he wasn't in the wrong location to begin with. I said in a preview to this message that we were going to deal with three things that can help spiritually fortify us when we're talking about building up our spiritual strength. One is location. I believe the Spirit of God can be with us wherever we are. I don't think there's a place where God's presence cannot dwell. However, because of our brokenness and our humanity, we can be weaker in certain locations. Hello? If you struggled with alcoholism and you struggled with the disease of addiction, I'm going to tell you right now, your evangelism should not happen in a bar. Hello? I can hang out at a bar. I don't, I, don't, I don't like the smell of alcohol. I have no taste for it. I never even understood acquired taste. To me, same with coffee. If something's an acquired taste, it means you have to go through a period where something tastes terrible, but you keep drinking until it tastes good. There's something wrong with that. <laughs> so I can probably do evangelism in a bar. You should not. When I was 18 years old, I had the privilege, actually 19 years old, I had the privilege of flying to Holland, uh, uh, Utrecht, Holland, and we were doing ministry there for the general conference session. And one of the evenings, I went with a team to a bar where one of the ministers was preaching. Elder Jose Rojas was preaching in a bar. I'll never forget, it was one of the most powerful messages I've ever heard. But I was in a bar as a young theology student in a bar. Was there a temptation for me? Absolutely not. I could be there, but if I struggled with it, it would be the wrong place for me to be. We need to be responsible from the, from the standpoint of know where your weaknesses are. Know where you, if, 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 if past 11 o'clock at night, you realize that your judgment is not as good, not as, as pristine, not as focused, then you most likely shouldn't be hanging out with folk you shouldn't be hanging out with past 11 o'clock at night. I probably should go a little bit earlier than that, but you know, it's a different generation. If you know there's certain people that if you're around them, you're going to, you're going to let down your guard and you're, you're going to be less filtered and you might put yourself in compromising situations, avoid the location. Watch this, watch this. I believe, I believe that the mistake that, that Eve and Adam make was first being near the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Hello? That's where it started. The serpent was not in the tree of life. He wasn't in the apple tree or in the vineyard. He was at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That was his only place. He was chained to that tree. So if they were going to talk to them, they had to be near that tree. 
Sometimes our first mistake and biggest mistake is being in the wrong location. Know yourself well enough. I know that sounds kind of old school. I get it, I get it, I get it. But it's still, it's still a principle that applies today. Samson was in the wrong place. And when he put himself in the wrong place, there was a snowball effect. There were a number of things that happened. Now, the Bible does say that the Spirit of God came upon him powerfully. The Spirit of God came upon him powerfully. When this happens, when this happens, the assumption is this is what God must want. God must want Samson to be powerful enough to destroy this line. Everything must be happening according to God's plan. But let me tell you something. The Spirit of God coming upon you powerfully doesn't necessarily mean in muscle. The Spirit of God coming upon us powerfully could be in wisdom and other spiritual gifts and vocations. Most of us become so enamored with strength that we think that is the thing that we should covet the most. It's interesting, in chapter 13, we're never told how Samson would deliver the Israelites from their oppressors. We're never told what spiritual gift he's given. And it's interesting, in the book of Judges, nobody is given the strength of super strength. No one's given that spiritual gift of super strength. No one is. It's only Samson. I'm wondering if God even needed muscle for Samson to do what God was calling him to do. The reason why we think that it's muscle is because this is what Samson exercises. But that doesn't mean this was God's main purpose. Why do I say that? How many battles does God say are won through the muscle of mankind? The Bible tells us that the battle is whose? The Lord's. And even in the book of Judges, we have one of the more famous stories that didn't require any muscle when 300 soldiers go up against an army that no man can number. And all they do is play, you know, their, 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 their iPhone's music, wave their iPhone's flashlight around, and it causes confusion among the enemies, and they end up destroying themselves. God doesn't need our muscle in order to rot victory. Yet, this is what we're drawn to. The Spirit of God comes upon Samson powerfully, and I'm going to say something here that's going to make some of you feel really uncomfortable, but the spiritual gifts that God gives us are also the spiritual gifts that Satan absolutely loves. When God blesses you with a spiritual gift, guess who just starts, mm, 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 I love this spiritual gift. Woo, I can have some fun with this spiritual gift. The spiritual gifts that God blesses us with are the same spiritual gifts that Satan himself can use for his own kingdom. And that's scary. Think about it for a second. Think about the things that you've been able to accomplish in life. The intelligence that, intelligence that you've had, the charm. Some of you have the gift of hospitality. You have to think about how those gifts are employed in everyday life. People who have the, the, the gift of song have used it to build up another kingdom other than God's. Just because God comes upon us powerfully with his Holy Spirit and imbues us with gifts that we can use for his kingdom doesn't mean that every time we use it, we're using it for the glory of God. Do I need to say that again? Just because God's Spirit comes upon us powerfully doesn't mean that we are using it powerfully for his kingdom. And that's what makes this so scary. I used to think that if God's Spirit was working with me, that this was a sign of God's approval of me. And there needs to be a distinction here, family. God accepts everyone. I believe that. God accepts every. He accepts you all. He accepts me just the way that I am. Everybody. Everybody that has breath in him, God accepts, and the church should have the same stance. However, God does not approve of everyone's choices, everyone's actions. Think about his disciples. Among his own disciples, Jesus imparted gifts to them to be able to evangelize. 
to be able to heal, to cast out demons. But did he approve of how they used all of their gifts? Did he approve of them when they were arguing who was the greatest? Did he approve of them when they denied him and betrayed him? Was that approval? I want you to think about it for a second. Think about something that God has done through you that made you feel like, wow, God, you must really like me. Think about it for a second. In thinking about that, what did that make you feel like? You're on the right track, right? I'm on the right track. God is pleased with me. I'm on the right track. Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23 says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, and they will say, but Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform many miracles in your name? All of this takes spiritual gifts. All of the things that Jesus acknowledged requires some manifestation of the Spirit. He says, yes, but I never knew you. Judas, who manifested spiritual gifts, Christ says, was a devil from the beginning. So just because the Spirit of God comes upon Samson very powerfully, don't think for a second that God approves of Samson's actions. Often in Christianity, often in our churches, there is a misuse of spiritual gifts. That is why we have more people leaving the church than people who are coming into the church. The college girls who recently got baptized are going to be so challenged when they go off to college, as they continue in high school, when they experience their first heartbreak. And you tell me, whoever breaks your heart the first time, I got them. but it'll, it'll, it'll challenge your faith. And then you're going to wonder, what did I really decide to do when I got baptized at 10, at 17 years old? What did I really accomplish? Is God real? Was it all a fairy tale? You'll be challenged again. You have friends and family that have shown up. This might be, for some of them, their first time in church in the last 10 years. We have such an abuse of spiritual gifts in the church that it has harmed more people than helped people. Some people tell me, oh, I've been given the gift of discernment. I have the gift of discernment, and I'm going to tell you right now, you ain't living right, and I'm calling you out in love. Oh, really? How do you know you calling them out was in love? Do you know how many times Jesus called out people's sins? No, seriously, straight up. Most of the sins he called out were, again, spiritual abuse type sins. But when he called out the sins that we want to be called out in the church regularly, he wrote them in the sand. He wrote them in the sand so that when the wind would blow, it would erase their shame. He could have easily called them out and said, Deacon Jenkins, you better drop that stone because I know exactly where you were last night on Bathsheba.com. He didn't say that. He could have it. He didn't say that. I'm just letting you know right now that most of our sins that hurt people is not sometimes our struggles with addiction or watching too many novellas. It is, it is, it is, a, it is a spiritual abuse of our gifts, and we have harmed people. I can't tell you how many well-intended parents and grandparents have chased their grandchildren and children away because they believe that they, they, are, they are the watchmen. And I got to say, I got to call them out right now. And many of us think because God does not call Samson out in this moment that God approves of Samson. I'm going to tell you right now, God does not approve of Samson's actions, but he's allowing things to play out because even God knows when to not say anything. Some things God knows will be wasted on the ears of us. And so he just stays quiet. They wouldn't listen to me anyways. During Jesus' trial, he stayed quiet because he knew anything he said would not be appreciated. They would not be heard. It'd be, it would be seed on stony, on stony pathways. But when he was alone with Pilate, he opened his mouth because he knew there was something fertile there and he was going to impart some truth. The Bible continues on. It says that 
in, in, in verse 7, we're going back to Judges 14 and verse 7, it says, then he went down and talked with the woman, and he liked her. I'm, I'm going to just give Samson some props that he at least talked to the woman, amen? Amen? He at least talked to her. I mean, I know he said to his father, she's the one for me, I'm going to marry her just by looking at her. I mean, it wasn't a lot of depth there, but at least he goes and talks to her, gets to know her a little bit, and he liked her even more. And then it says that sometime later, in verse 8, sometime later when he went back to marry her, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass, and in it he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. He scooped out the honey with his hands and ate it as he went along. When he joined his parents, he gave them some, he gave them some and they too ate it, but he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. Why did he not tell them? Because it was dead. He knew he had defiled himself. He knew if his parents knew they would be all over his case. So here we go right now. Watch this, family. Watch this. By this point, Samson has already broken his Nazarite vows. Hello? Which means that he should no longer be manifesting any supernatural spiritual strength or physical strength. Right? Many of us have believed that it was his hair and hair alone that was the secret to his strength. It wasn't just his hair, it was his Nazarite vow that set him apart. And he's breaking it right now. I bet you God's spirit's going to leave him. You watch, you watch. So it says in verse 10 that now his father went down to see the woman. This is good. They're, they're trying to get to know the lady. And there Samson held a feast as was customary for young men. When the people saw him, they chose 30 men to be his companions. And then he says, let me tell you a riddle. If you can give me the answer within the seven days of the feast, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. If you can tell me the answer, you if you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. Tell us your riddle, they said. Let's hear it. He replied, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. For three days, they could not give an answer. Okay, so he's going to a bar slash vineyard. He's killing things and around dead things. He's even eating from these dead carcasses, not telling anybody. And now I find out he's even more an Adventist. He's gambling. <laughs> I'm sorry, cut this man off. After three days, they could not understand the riddle. So in verse 15, it says, on the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, Coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us, or we will burn you and your father's household to death. All of this because my man just wants to find a way to make some money. Did you invite us here to steal our property? Then Samson's wife threw herself on him, sobbing, you hate me. You don't even really love me. Doesn't that sound like so 2024? And this was the Old Testament. See, ladies, y'all never even change. No, I'm not, I'm messing, I'm messing, I'm messing, I'm messing. I'm, messing. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My apologies, my apologies. But this is what the Word of God says. You hate me. You don't even really love me. I don't even think you want to marry me. Okay, I made that one up. But You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't even told me the answer. Honey, I get that you want to trick them, but don't trick me. I'm in love with you. He says to them, I have, says to her, I haven't even explained it to my father and mother. So why should I explain it to you? She cried the whole seven days of the feast. Now, to her credit, she had good reason to cry, okay? Can I just be honest? Ladies, you have good reasons to cry sometimes. I get it, I get it. She had good reason to cry. She was going to be burned alive along with her, her father and his household. But she cried for seven days. For seven days, she's in tears for the entire feast. She's not happy. 
And then what happens? So on the seventh day, he finally told her because she continued to press him. Foreshadow anyone? Foreshadow anyone? Are we learning a little bit of Samson's weakness? Oh, you're going to nag me to death. All right, I'll tell you. And guess who sits back here and is taking notes? Who's taking notes? That's right. The Philistines are taking notes. Satan takes notes. These little areas where we compromise, Satan sits back and says, I got you. Oh, you're a pleaser. Oh, that's so cute. You want to make people happy. Oh, I have some situations I can put you in where you are having to please people and it'll compromise your purpose, your character. Oh, this is going to be good. I love your gifts. Oh, you're really good at inspiring people. You're so talented. Oh, I love this. So wonderful. In fact, I'm going to make you good at a lot of things. This is going to be great. I think I love that God is just blessing you. Just, I think he should just keep trusting you with more of his talents because you're doing so well with the few that he gave you. I hope he gives you more. I am going to just work you to death. I cannot wait. You'll never be able to say no to anybody. You're such a pleaser. And they need you. They love you. They, they wouldn't be able to do anything without you. You have to be there. You have to show up. Oh, this is going to be great. The same gifts that God blesses you with are the same gifts that the enemy is overjoyed that you have because he's going to abuse you. He's going to abuse you. And here in this moment, it's a foreshadow of things to come. Samson is already giving information to the enemy on how to destroy him. The Bible says that she then tells her people, she explained the riddle to her people. Verse 18 says, before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town said to him, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved the riddle. I know that sounds bad, but heifer means like young cow. That still sounds bad, my man. If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved the riddle. Then the spirit of the Lord, in verse 19, came powerfully upon him. He went down and struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of everything, gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home, and Samson's wife was given to one of his companions who had attended him at the feast. Look at the spirit of the Lord just working so powerfully in Samson's life. Or is it not? The man murders 30 innocent men. Strips them of their clothes. Leaves them naked and bleeding in the streets. Because he's not going to come out of pocket for the gamble that he made. And then in anger, leaves his wife at the altar. Isn't God good family? This isn't God. And it's time we call sin by its rightful name. The spirit of God is good. Samson is not. And this challenges me, family, because... I want to be able to say that in order to read the whole, receive the Holy Spirit, you must, you must exercise a certain level of, of, of trust and, and quality of character for God to, to entrust you. But you have to understand something. Samson's misuse of his strength does not represent God's intention for that strength. Just because Samson is misusing God's strength, misusing God's gifts, does not in any way imply that this was God's intention from the very beginning. And this is a struggle for me because why would the Spirit of God come upon powerfully upon Samson if he knows Samson's character isn't ready for the spiritual gift? Why? Why not choose good people to give your Holy Spirit to? Why not choose righteous people to give your Holy Spirit to? Why, family? 
Why would he entrust his very presence with a man who is so carnal, a man who has no respect for his duty and for his purpose, a man who doesn't care about, about the promise that he made God? Why would the Holy Spirit still move powerfully upon this man? Why not choose good and righteous people? You want to know why? Because there are no good or righteous people. Who else is God supposed to, supposed to work with? Do you know of any good, righteous people? Well, my dad is a good man. Yeah, yeah, by maybe your standards. But a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Has your father borne bad fruit? He's a bad tree then. There are no good and righteous people. This is scripture. When the rich young ruler goes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to be saved? Christ says, why do you call me good? There's only one who is good. We'll close on this. There is only one that is good, and that is Jesus Christ. I am going to contend that the reason why the Holy Spirit moves upon Samson is because he is such a bad character. How else can God win back his heart unless his spirit moves upon him powerfully? Oh, but pastor, he's still misusing the gift. Yes, because that's where Samson is right now. But God knows where he's taking him eventually. Remember what we talked about last week in Acts chapter 15. Peter says, God knows the heart of the Gentiles. That's why he gives them his Holy Spirit. Not because of their perfect obedience. Not because they've done everything right. He knows their heart. And I'm telling you right now, he knows Samson's heart. It is poisoned. It is broken. It is hedonistic. It is carnal, it is selfish, it is arrogant, it's all those things. And the Holy Spirit says, get me in. Let me see what I can do. Let me see what I can do, right? Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you and cleanse you from everything that defiles you. I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new mind. I will put my spirit in you and see to it that you keep my laws and commands. There's someone here today that is lived a chapter 14 like this. Not chapter 13 of, of monetary bank bankruptcy, but chapter 14, spiritual bankruptcy. You've been at the wrong place at the wrong time, knowingly. You've touched things you're not supposed to touch, hello? You've eaten things you're not supposed to eat, hello? You've allowed your anger to be your guide. You've exploited people. You've used your spiritual gifts for your own gain. You also have a chapter 14 like Samson. And God is calling you. Yes, God is calling you. He's calling you right now. And he wants his spirit to reside in you. He wants his spirit to come powerfully upon you. So Father, we ask you for your forgiveness. Forgive us for failing to recognize our surroundings, the situations we place ourselves in. Forgive us for not honoring the vows that we've made to you. Forgive us for thinking that we're too bad, that you could never use us and that your Holy Spirit could never move us. So we've opened our hearts to you again. Come into our lives in a powerful way. We're not looking for the power that is muscle focused. We're looking for the power that gives us wisdom, understanding, and more knowledge of you. We want to break the binds and the chains the enemy 
has incarcerated us with so that we can be the free people you've called us to live out in the lives of our families and communities. Holy Spirit, reign on us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen.